Okay. We should be recording now. Yeah. So welcome to those joining us online. We're doing metastases and simulants of metastasis. So we can start with this one. <coughs> I mean, Shakti looks like a mat. <laughs> and then the key is how are you going to proceed from here? So, um, Manuel, what would you think looking at this one? Breast? Um, yeah, breast would be quite likely. It's certainly adeno. You can see the duct differentiation here. So if you have an adenocarcinoma of unknown primary, any, uh, any particular stains or things you can do to work your way through? So CD7 and 20 are commonly done. CK. CK, thank you. Um, um, keratin 7 is commonly above the diaphragm tumors. 20 is commonly below the diaphragm tumors, there are um, some that co-express, and so that's one way to, to navigate your way through. You know, breast being an above the diaphragm tumor tends to be a um, CD7 positive tumor. And that's if you don't have more characteristic changes. This one was a nevus removed to remove a bothersome nevus and happens to be full of breast metastasis. So you know you will have incidental identification uh, of metastatic carcinoma as well. And then there are some that are a little more characteristic than, than others. In this, the question might be, is this a primary tumor versus a metastatic tumor? If the question is primary versus met, there are some things that can help, ultimately being history and imaging studies. Uh, in this case, it sits appears to sit probably within lymphatic spaces. You can get a D240 to confirm that this is in fact a lymphatic space with tumors sitting inside. P63 is positive in lung tumor. It's also positive in in cutaneous, primary cutaneous adenocarcinomas and negative in most other metastatic disease. So um, P63 positivity can help to, to favor a primary adnexal neoplasm if that's a question whether or not it's in lymphatics and then of course imaging studies. through some key some key entities that you would need to be able to recognize. So Faye, what do you think about this one? Uh, green. So it is a clear cell neoplasm forming tubules, <coughs> very bloody, lots of blood in between. So suspect certainly for renal cell carcinoma, as you said. And then there are certain antibodies, again, that can be helpful. RCC? So RCC is fairly specific for renal cell carcinoma. And uh, if you don't happen to have that in your lab, CD10 also stains renal cell carcinoma and is something that pretty much any lab will have. So those are and commonly GATA. in use. GATA. GATA is used for a variety of things from breast to other tumors. So 
um, you know, often you have to work with what you happen to have in your in your lab. This is another example of a metastatic breast, just showing you know tumor within many spaces, some of which are most likely lymphatic spaces, mm -hmm. and that could be confirmed with a D240 stain. And certainly an adenocarcinoma with evidence of lumen formation within the, within the tumor. So yeah, what do you think? Mm, is it long carcinoma? So um, this particular one could be it. I don't see evidence of adeno differentiation. Um, in fact, I see some areas that look like single cell keratinization. You have to distinguish that from trapped collagen, but like mm -hmm. that looks like maybe a keratinizing cell. You could confirm with high molecular weight keratins. Low molecular weight tend to be an adenocarcinoma. It's high molecular weight in squamous cell carcinoma. This one would stain as a squamous cell carcinoma. By pattern, not quite clear whether it connects to the epidermis. This happened to be a metastatic squame from cervix. But it could be a primary cutaneous squame out of plane of section. Epidermotropic metastasis definitely happens where things, especially squamous cell carcinomas, can attach to the epidermis and can look like primary carcinoma. So you have to bear the possibility of metastasis in mind. Things that are, this is kind of like a big oval almost like a bowling ball. It's not irregular in shape. That's one of the clues to metastatic disease. And then of course patient history. Looking at this one you can see many mitotic figures. It's obviously malignant. I don't see good duct differentiation. There really could be a question of, you know, is it adenocarcinoma or not? A CEA looking for um, duct differentiation it can be helpful. Musicarmine can be helpful. In this particular case, it's actually a carcinoid. And that can have a, a wide spectrum of, of appearance. Okay. This is one that's a little more recognizable. So, Dan, you want to jump in for this one? Yeah, sure. Um, I found glandular, it sort of resembles. Colon, there's a lot of um, inflammation, some necrosis, a lot of goblets. So they're goblet cells. It's a columnar epithelium, goblet cells, dirty necrosis, inflammation. All of that together suggests colon carcinoma, which is what that could be, but what it actually is is primary colon carcinoma in a and an ostomy mm. site. So it's primary gut <coughs> carcinoma that arose in an ostomy site. Um, patient referred to us because the stoma was leaking. She couldn't get a good seal. Mm. Rosettes of cells, colloid in the middle. one of the possible appearance for thyroid carcinoma. Thyroid, we have um, follicular and papillary 
papillary tends to have the orphan nuclei, which you do actually see here. So, so nuclear pseudo-inclusions, orphan anti nuclei, both tend to go with papillary. There's a follicular variant of of papillary carcinoma, and you know at that point, if you get as far as thyroid, you can always hand it over to a search path colleague because there's more work that would need to be done. And most of the reading that you would do would um, probably not not relate to the most recent mm -hmm. updates. So, you know, good to call in someone who does it all the time at that point. Here's another adenocarcinoma. You can see the duct differentiation. And the key here is, one, you have central necrosis, and you've got a big bowling ball sitting in the dermis. The chance of that being a primary tumor is pretty small. Um, look at some of the other key. Let's see, you want to recognize renal, Renal and carcinoma and Quiraz are probably the, the most important ones that you should actually recognize in tissue. So this is a, a very typical example of renal. Big nodule, clear cell tubules, lots of blood in between. So that's a good image to burn into your brain as metastatic renal cell carcinoma. We commonly would see that on scalp. Okay. So, Mark, what do you see here? Um, all right, I see. I'm probably lymphatic. It was like a thickened wall, whatever we're looking at, uh, with definitely some inflammation around it, some lymphocytes, some extravasated blood cells, so maybe it's uh, vascular sites we're looking at. Um, so not necessarily in the lymphatic. There's definitely stroma around mm -hmm. it, fibromyxoid. There are plump mesenchymal cells in the stroma. There's red cell extravasation in the stroma. A columnar epithelium that looks secretory. So, duct and breast. Duct so, yeah, endometriosis. Endometri oh, endometriosis. So, oh. endometriosis was one of the important simulants mm. of metastatic disease. Right? You're mm -hmm. going to see a highly proliferative and sometimes mitotically active columnar epithelium looks secretory and then the key is really the stroma mm -hmm. and the stroma you have a fibromyxoid stroma you have these plump mesenchymal cells and you have red cell extravasation and often hemosiderin because it bleeds in a monthly fashion <coughs> So endometriosis would be uh, an important simulant of metastasis that is pretty much in your scope of practice to identify. Another example of renal, tubules, clear cells, very bloody. Arborizing vascular pattern, sometimes described as chicken wire like vascular pattern between those, which tends to go with malignant neoplasm. One of the things that we used to do was get a PAS stain because there, there's a lot of glycogen in them. Um, nowadays that wouldn't be done as often, you know, probably straight to a renal RCC antigen marker. Okay, so in this case, we have lots of smooth muscle. We have mammary duct. And then in the skin of the breast, you see 
tumor lodged in lymphatics in a breast that looked like it had cellulitis. So that's inflammatory carcinoma. It, so inflammatory carcinoma, no lymphocytes. It's not inflammatory histologically. It, is, it mimics inflammation clinically. So typical patient would be a woman post lumpectomy or mastectomy, um, you know, 35, 40, worried because she's got faint erythema on the chest wall. Her surgeon and everyone is telling her it's nothing, it's just a rash, and she's worried that's one you must biopsy because that's exactly what inflammatory carcinoma looks like when it presents. this one, Katie. Cells lining up splaying collagen. So single cells between splayed collagen, lots of new ropey collagen, some mucin as well. And the cells flatten, there's nuclear molding, so they flatten against one another like boxcars. Yeah, the medicine of carcinoma, carcinoma and cross. So carcinoma and cross. A cross is what <coughs> Greek soldiers in the Peloponnesian Wars would wear. Armor at that time, what you'd wear on your chest was a hardened leather. So a cross is like a hard leather case you would wear over your chest to protect you and carcinoma on cross because of the collagen formation is a, a hard, um, hard thickening of the, the skin where it gets its name. That's good. I feel like most things have to do with food and pathology that are, you know, <laughs> like similes or metaphors. That is true. Oh, that, that's, an, that's a unique Most one. are food, that one's an exception. <laughs> You're a hungry creature. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Another that you might that you might see, and the fellows certainly have to recognize. You have, in this case, what looks almost like cartilage, mm -hmm. and attempts at bone formation, but it's bad, lacy bone. Those are the sorts of things you can see in an osteosarcoma. And then often areas of necrosis as well. You wouldn't necessarily be expected to recognize every one of these tumors. You certainly would be expected to recognize renal, to recognize carcinoma cross, um, and to know when to suspect that something is metastatic rather than primary in skin, and um, refer or, or seek help. So big ball in skin, mm -hmm. suggesting metastatic disease. What's the morphology of these cells where you have a big red blob of cytoplasm with an eccentric nucleus? How do you describe that kind of morphology? Vesicular? No, no. Um, oh, no. So yeah. rhabdoid. Oh. <laughs> 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 Rhabdoid. So a rhabdomyoblast, like mm -hmm. what you'd see in um, rhabdosarcoma, mm -hmm. um, has a big pink blob in the cytoplasm and then an eccentric nucleus. So these are all rhabdoid cells. The, by far the most common rhabdoid malignancy in skin is melanoma. 
In fact, that's a really common morphology for melanoma, to have that big eccentric blob of pink and then a nucleus pushed off to the side. Um, most striated muscle tumors are round blue cell tumors, and then you might get one or two of these, what are called strap cells, where it's um, forming a rhabdoid morphology. The, there um, are primary rhabdoid tumors in skin um, that are other than other than melanoma, but rhabdoid morphology is a big clue to melanoma. Just these are terms that you're going to see in reports, mm -hmm. um, and so you need to be aware of them. So this was an atypical nevus that was taken off. And you can see it's patchy perivascular, periadnexal, a little bit splayed between collagens, so it's a congenital nevus that those are often a little mottled and irregular. What was unsuspected is what's in the dermis under the nevus, which again is metastatic disease, lodged in lymphatics. On review, that whole leg where the nevus was is kind of faintly erythematous and this was an inflammatory carcinoma of a bladder primary um, picked up as incidental finding when a um, nevus was removed. And So this, let's see if we can find any, well, this particular one just looks like an ugly adenocarcinoma. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing a few signet ring type cells. This one happened to be ovary. And there, there are markers um, that can be used both in serum and in tissue for ovarian, but again, you're likely to to want help from one of your colleagues on that. So this kind of resembles rhabdoid cells, except that many of the nuclei are central, and you have a bright red granular cytoplasm. Those are what are called oncocytes. So, um, do you know any cutaneous syndrome where you get renal oncocytomas? Bert Hoff did that. So you, you memorize that word, oncocytoma, <laughs> with Bert Hoff Dubé. What does it mean? It's a renal cancer that has central nuclei in these bright red granular cells. So Bert Hoch Dubé was described fairly early as a cancer syndrome because you have an unusual tumor that is um, traveling in families with bumpy faces, right? So it's not a common tumor, it was a little bit unusual tumor. And then the families are bumpy faced families, so that was a clue that it may be a cancer syndrome. Okay, so Sam, what do you think here? Um, all right. So it looks like it looks like adenocarcinoma, I'd say. So like you certainly have a columnar epithelium; mm -hmm. it looks secretory. So you have cell a fiber mixoid stroma with lots of red cell extravasation and lots of plump cells. Endometri it endometriosis. is endometriosis. <laughs> you are correct. <coughs> That's something you would want to recognize. Okay, so first thing is how old is this patient? Look how bright red that collagen is. So bright red, small collagen is kid skin. And then within this kid skin, you have something that almost looks like angiosarcoma. 
right? It is cracking spaces all through that kid skin. So how often do kids get angiosarc, first off? Not very common. That tends to be an old man tumor, right? So it looks kind of like angiosarcoma, but when you get to every collagen bundle, it's kind of been wrapped by little gray processes. So there's gray wrapping around every every collagen bundle. So anyone with thoughts on that? In a kid's scalp, often with a plasia cutis, that's what meningocele looks like, uh. rud rudimentary meningocele. So it's going to look almost like angiosarcoma, but with gray processes wrapping every bundle of collagen. Because that's what meningothelial cells do for a living, is coat things, wrap things. It wants to wrap everything in sight. So that can be helpful in terms of that. A bump on the chest with this glandular material, ducts, sebaceous gland, smooth muscle would be probably right here and then right there and then right there. Yeah, supernumerary <laughs> nipples or accessory nipples. So the clue is that you'll have glandular cells that can look anywhere from apocrine to more folded secretory breast tissue, and then ducts, sebaceous gland, erector pili, um, just like you would see on an ordinary nipple. This one looks to me, very similar to gut carcinoma. Mm. It was, by history, a cholangiocarcinoma. Mm. Um, Dan, you want to teach us any? Uh, I've seen some where you actually see bile, but what else What else would be a hint to cholangiocarcinoma? It's somewhat bland, um, and the pigment sometimes can help you, but um, it's a it's a tricky one because of the blandness of the cytology sometimes to, to pick up. And again, so patient history and imaging may be, yeah. may be key. of highly atypical cells, some of which have clock face nuclei and, and eccentric nuclei with a rim of cytoplasm, so they look like really ugly plasma cells. That's what you can see in myeloma. Now if they're sheets of monotypic plasma cells that are not so ugly, look more like mature plasma cells, you're probably dealing with a marginal zone lymphoma, just overpopulated with plasma cells. Myelomas should be um, pretty undifferentiated, ugly looking plasma cells. Um, most of what used to be classified as um, primary cutaneous plasma cytoma is just marginal zone lymphoma. Marginal zone lymphomas usually have plasma cells at the periphery. They're light chain restricted. That's one of the ways you can diagnose marginal zone lymphoma, but they can overpopulate. So this is a vulvar lesion. And you have a lot of glandular tissue ductectasia. I wouldn't sign this out myself. I would share it around, but this um, was a patient with an entire milk line intact all the way down to the vulva.
This one is a little misleading. You see tumor in the lymphatic, so that would make it inflammatory carcinoma. This one is actually inflammatory, they're lymphocytes, mm -hmm. but usually that has nothing to do with inflammatory carcinoma. The inflammatory part is that it mimics cellulitis clinically or erysipelas, which is why it's sometimes called carcinoma erysipelas erysipeloides or erysipelatoides. Sometimes they throw in an extra consonant in there. Mm -hmm. And then this is on the breast itself, a very papillary tumor that looks kind of like an HPAP, right? But an HPAP in the nipple, you can see myoepithelial cells preserved. If there's a question, you can always get a P63 and see that that whole layer there of cells is myoepithelial cells. Myoepithelial cells will be preserved in in situ carcinoma, but also in um, primary nipple adenoma, which is essentially like an HPAP in the nipple. And clinically often mimics pagets and also gets called a rose of adenomatosis of the nipple. Okay, I think we have covered the important ones for you to know there and we should grab a, at random from the bottom shelf, grab a potpourri box. And let's do some potpourri in the time we have left. Okay, so you have now completed mm -hmm. the entire book. There is now nothing you do not know, <laughs> oh. <laughs> right? Oh. Um, so the problem is what one of my classmates in med school referred to as Teflon syndrome where it just will not stick. So the, the only thing to do is review. Mm -hmm. Now part of that review is the fact that you have two more years of residency mm -hmm. where we will go through everything again. But other, you take the opportunity to start going through potpourri. Because both in real life and on your board exam, things do not come with the chapter written on them. Mm -hmm. right? And so you have to think outside the box, outside the chapter, and um, start to be able to recognize common patterns of, of slides. So um, just taking some of your time and just starting to go through potpourri boxes is the most effective way to study the remainder of your time. And we happen to have what we've got. Oh. 65. Yeah, so 6,500 <laughs> potpourri <laughs> slides sitting there for you to review. Um, so there, there are just a few. Is there any order to those, or they're literally just like random? The potpourri yeah, uh -huh. are potpourri. Okay. Right? So we have plenty of things organized by chapter. Okay. So if you are weak on a given chapter, or during your first year of residency, you all likely took vacation. Right, so you probably missed a chapter. Go through that chapter. Right, so we have boxes on the chapter that you may have missed. Um, we have lots of examples, chapter by chapter, and then we have lots and lots of potpourri. So, and while well, you want to start, and we'll just keep going around. I can't really describe those as so the previous section more like a warty D So you see corons and grains, that could be warty D, that could be Darius, that could be Grovers. In this case you have multiple small foci um, which could be a hint to Grovers that you have more than just the one focus that I was um, giving you a high power on.
interface. And interface, and what kind of cells are at the junction? Uh, EOS. You know. EOS and NUT, single file at the DE junction, what could that be? Uh, Octarial uh, BP. Yeah, so urticarial phase of BP, or anytime you say BP, you also have to say EBA, yes. right? So it could just as easily be urticarial phase of epidermolysis bullosa acquisita. And this one was BP, just as you suspected. Hyperkeratosis, hypergranulosis, angiofibroplasia of the papillary dermis. You sh normally should not see any bundled or ropey collagen above the postcapillary venule. Absolutely. Vertical streaking of collagen, like in simplex chronicus. an SPAP because you can slide into <laughs> it as opposed to an HPAP which would all be down here so you could hide, hide in the HPAP, slide in the SPAP. Trichilomoma, very good. So you have something hanging off the epidermis it has clear cells, it's glycogenated, it has peripheral palisading, and just beyond the peripheral palisade tends to be a nice thick basement membrane zone. So someone passed the easy button over there. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta watch them, because they're tricky, those little <laughs> tricky little mamas. I don't know. Italian, very good. <laughs> I think there's an interface dermatitis. Um, and there's all these big clear cells in the epidermis, well, clearer cells in the epidermis, like a blue gray cytoplasm. Okay. And do they sit at the DE junction or do they crush a basal layer? The basal layer is crushed. So what is it? I, I think it's the basal layer looks like it's crushed. But it's like they're all. They're so your diagnosis? Uh, uh, what gives big amphiphilic gray cells? In buckshot scatter and nests within the epidermis, crushing a basal layer. Uh, oh, melanoma. Uh, no. Not melanoma, because melanoma starts at the DE junction. So Sam's trying to tell you it yeah. is Paget's. Oh, Pad so Paget's disease is oh, the yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. So when we see buckshot scatter yeah, like that, there, there, you sometimes yeah. refer to it as Pagetoid <laughs> scatter. When you see big gray cells with ample cytoplasm in the epidermis, you sometimes refer to them as pagetoid cells, pagetoid cytology. And then pagets versus melanoma, pagets crushes the basal layer. Bowens can also. Um, one of the clues there is pagets tends to spit cells out into the epidermis, yeah, out mm -hmm. into the corneum whereas Bowen's keratinizes, and so it disappears into the corneum. <coughs> busy dermis. Busy dermis, and then you have, what's that gray stuff? Mucin. Mucin, and is it uniform top to body side? top to bottom, side to side, or is it yeah. patchy? It's patchy. It's patchy. So what would be patchy with mucin and busy busy and histiocytes? Ah, uh, G, no. Yeah. So GA? GA. GA oh, is no. patchy. <laughs> GA is patchy, whereas NLD <laughs> is top to bottom, side to side. Okay. Right, NLD is top to bottom, side to side, GA is patchy. Okay. Um, all right, so, oh, we're zooming in on something. All right, so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's, that was some, 
some perivascular infiltrate, but then there's some, like, I guess, I'm trying to see, there's kind of pinkish red. Yes, so what are these crumbly amphiphilic fibers throughout the dermis? Is it like that are calcified elastic fibers. Oh, Pseudoxanthelma elasticum. Very good. Um, but what if that were a periumbilical papule in a multiparous black female with lots of stria? So periumbilicating, periumbilical mm -hmm. perforating calcific elastosis. Mm -hmm is a pseudo PXE that can occur on the abdomen. More commonly women of a African extraction, often they've had multiple kids. So it's a type of calcified stria. Mm. Okay. So you got a busy, busy dermis. Yeah, this looks kind of patchy. And it looks patchy, and it's patchy around what? Like around the next. Around well, around adnexa and around pre-existing vessels okay. and around pre-existing erector pili. So what around is busy, busy, adnexa. but patchy around every pre-existing structure in the dermis? Anyone? Capuchies. KS. So lupus would give you lymphocytes, peri, adnexal. But here you've got busy, busy, see little crack-like spaces in there? Mm -hmm. yeah. So little crack-like spaces, busy, busy, and patchy around every pre-existing structure in the dermis is capuchies. Okay. That's what plaque capuchies looks like. Yeah, masson tumor, IPEH, intravascular papillary endothelial hyperplasia. So you have probably an angiokeratoma that thrombosed, recanalization of the thrombus, and so you have all the fibrin cores with the papillary projections within a vascular space. So masson's IPEH. Intravascular papillary endothelial hyperplasia of muscle. Oh, okay. Pilometricoma. a little slow, but otherwise very good. <laughs> you get the easy button. So <laughs> pilometricoma, you see calcification and you see ghost or shadow cells and sometimes basaloid cells as well. Just <laughs> Leukocytoclastic vasculitis. You have expansion of the vessel wall, fibrin, neutrophils, cariorexis. EOs may or may not be present. In this case, your endothelium is intact. So if it's postcapillary venial only, endothelium intact, you can get perforators. So mid dermis is no man's land. So perforators can occur. But this is predominantly postcapillary venial, endothelium's intact. Your differential includes HSP, mixed cryoglobulinemia, most connective tissue disease, serum sickness, most drug. If it were instead deeper vessels down here with necrosis of endothelium, then you have your ANCA associated vasculitides, rheumatoid, septic, and then two drugs that tend to do that, propothiouracil and montelukast, that tend to give ANCA associated <laughs> vasculitis. And then levamisole, um, if 
you consider, I suppose that is a drug. <laughs> Looks like a clear cell acanthoma. A clear cell acanthoma, always a neutrophilic crust, sharp cut off from the surrounding epidermis, glycogenated, and then if you look on higher power, there'll always be neutrophils and karyorexis within the clear cell acanthoma, working their way up to that neutrophilic crust. So it is melanoma, fairly symmetrical side to side, except when you look at the epidermis, there's so-called consumption of the epidermis here. The, it's all the way, nest sitting all the way up against the corneum. At the base, you have a parallel theek pattern, where you have parallel rows, like a trabecular pattern of tumor at the base. That's very common for melanoma. For nevoid melanoma that may appear symmetrical at scan, in this case, there's really no maturation and no dispersion at the base. And the other bit of history is that this is actually metastasis and this is epidermotropic matter. Okay. Ten minutes remaining. We ought to be able to do a hundred slides. <laughs> <laughs> so first off, stuff. you have some ulceration yes. here, right? And then what else do you have? Uh, is it an artifact or a blister forming? No. So neutrophils crust. That may actually be where there's been a prior shave biopsy. Mm. And then what's at the periphery here? Uh, loops like collagen, ex like pushing into the. Well, so you have red ropey collagen, mm -hmm. and you have these cells at the DE junction. Like a vacuole or. Um, well, they're they're actually melanocytes. Oh. And are they content to stay at the tips and sides of reedy, or are they crawling up into the arches in no. a poorly nested fashion? The second one. <laughs> so they're crawling the up one. into the arches. So, what is your arch enemy? This melanoma. Melanoma. Yeah. Right. So that's MIS. So, <laughs> everyone's favorite, <laughs> alopecia. No. Uh, are all the hair follicles the same size, or do you have big ones and little ones? Big ones and little ones. So, if you've got big ones and little ones, you got miniaturization. Yes. What are three things that can give you miniaturization of the follicles? Oh, man. Alopecia areata. So, AA, and anytime you say AA, you also have to say... Syphilis. Syphilis. Okay. So syphilis AA, syphilis, and pattern alopecia. So yeah. just by seeing that you have different sizes of the follicles, you, you're down to three things. Alopecia areata, syphilis, or pattern alopecia. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look to see in the fibrous tracts, is there pigment, are there EOs? Yes. Actually, no. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no those are some erythrocytes. No. Oh, yes. um, so they're just normal <laughs> fibrous tracts. So this was pattern alopecia, but eosinophils, pigment in the fibrous tract remnant, those would be things that would lead you towards um, alopecia areata or syphilis. Every time you say AA, you have to say syphilis as well. So kind of a right. bump, yeah. acanthosis, angiofibroplasia, the papillary dermis. Some superficial perivascular inflammation. Let's yep. see. And in some areas, it doesn't show up as prominently in this one, but a little bit of certainly loss of the hypergranulosis. Sometimes it can be eosinophilic necrosis of the granular layer. So what would be a bump? with hyperkeratosis, acanthosis, 
and angiofibroplasia, the papillodermis with vertical streaking of collagen. Prigo. Prigo. Yeah. And that mm. focal necrosis of the um, mm. of the granular layer is fingernail work. <laughs> Dilated spaces. So you got that, and you've got all of this, and you got all of that. Mm -hmm. You can see the way it's arranged here. So you have those things with this surrounding it, with lots of red cells in it. What is this? Looks like the endometriosis. This is endometriosis. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you said it exactly right. It looks, like looks <laughs> <laughs> it looks like endometriosis. Yeah. That's what all of clinical derm is. Why is it psoriasis? Because it looks like psoriasis. Like <laughs> right? Why is it endometriosis? Because it looks like endometriosis. <laughs> then you have to go one step beyond and say, okay, <laughs> what are the characteristics that looks like psoriasis or endometriosis? But it's just pattern recognition. Right? Um, It's more than saying it looks. Larger was, spindle yeah. than epithelioid cells. Let's say more like a spitz. Like a spitz. Trying to. It has a little bit of a junctional component. It's mainly dermal. It does disperse in the deep layers, and then you also look at the collagen. It's small and very red, so it does look like child skin. Right, you have something that looks like a spitz in an 80-year-old, think again. You have something that looks like a spitz and it looks like kid skin, well, and you're feeling a little bit better. So, desmoplastic melanoma, very important consideration because you have nodular lymphoid infiltrates and something sclerotic in the dermis. One of the clues here is you have a plate-like acanthosis overlying. Uh, so, DF? So, it could just be DF with inflammation, definitely worth getting immunostains. So, you know, you might get a SOX10 and a 13A, just make sure that it's not desmoplastic melanoma, but very well done. You get the easy button again. <laughs> so it could be melanocytic. We look higher and it's actually dead reds. So you have an interface dermatitis with necrotic keratinocytes. And looking at your corneum, is this a chronic process, an acute process, or a subacute process? Subacute. Subacute because you have basket weave on top of compact red. So, what kind of subacute process would give you lots of interface dermatitis with lots of PR. necrotic PR. keratinocytes? PR. So, PR tends to be spongiotic. PLC would be interface. Viral exanthem would be interface. Drug eruption would be interface. Um, graft versus host would be interface. This particular example is graft versus host mm -hmm. disease. I don't really see the clue of a lot of background atypia and, and disorder of the epidermis in this example. But acute drug eruption, syphilis, graft versus host would all be in the, in the differential. Viral exanthem would be in the differential. Holes in the external cornea. Yeah, so and, first off, is your corneum acute, subacute, or chronic? Um, That's a very chronic, the thick location. corneum, right? But I see some bacteria there, so maybe this is like a mm -hmm. pitted uh, keratolysis. So pitted keratolysis would be a thought. 
Um, these are kind of intermediate in size, but at least some of them you can see <coughs> become hollow. Look like they're cytoplasm, so rather than being an erythrasma type pattern, they also go into budding forms and they're vertically oriented. So this is all candida, and this is a patient with Job syndrome and massive hyperkeratosis that's all candidiasis. And with that, we are done. Thank you. Thank you. Where's the hard button? <laughs> 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 <laughs>